5090 all about biology this is uh, <clears throat> uh, now we're going to do November 2016 paper 1 2 and we're going to do the first 22 questions and uh, we're going to start Bismillah Rahman Rahim the question 1 was very basic the diagram shows a plant cell uh, which two structures are not found in animal cells now we all know that there is a cell wall which is not present in an animal cell and we know that the large vacuole is not present in so one was the large vacuole and two was the cell wall now what was three three was the nucleus four was the cytoplasm and five was a cell membrane so all those three are present in the animal cell but which were not found in the animal cell was cell wall which is uh, not present in animal cells and the large central vacuole which is not present in animal cells so coming to question number two uh, this has a comment in the examiner's report it says the interpretation of the graphs provided a proof challenging candidates had to appreciate that nitrates are absorbed actively and so they will be absorbed when their concentration is lower or higher in the soil than in the plant roots so you had to appreciate these graphs now the role the question was the the rate of nitrate ion absorption by a root hair cell was measured at different soil nitrate concentrations at x the concentration of nitrate in the soil is same as in the cell so this is the root hair cell and see the concentration inside is 10 and outside also it's 10 so that was the point which was x at x the concentration of nitrate in the soil is the same as in the cell in the root hair cell which graph shows how the rate of absorption varies with nitrate concentration in the soil which graph shows how the rate of absorption varies with nitrate concentration in the soil So all the four have nitrate concentrations in the soil on the x-axis. Let's look at all the four graphs. And then you see something which is very interesting is that these two graphs, they start, the rate of nitrate starts at x. Let's look at these two graphs. This starts at x and then levels out. At X, it said the concentration of the nitrate content in the soil. It says at X, the concentration of nitrate in the soil is the same as in the cell. But active transport, even if it is less outside, even if it is 5 outside, active transport ions will still enter. So it should have started much earlier. And active transport would still take place even if it was lesser than X. So if it was say 10 outside and 10 inside, of course, then it's fine. Then it's going to stop diffusion. Diffusion. But if it's going to be now say 9 outside and 10 inside, it's still going to be taken in by active transport. So which graph shows how the rate of absorption, rate of absorption varies with nitrate concentration in the soil? So it had started before X. So that's why you see the graph here is very different. The graph starts at zero, it starts to increase, rate keeps on increasing, increasing, and then it levels out. Why does it level out? Because the root hair cell, what we have to understand is that the root hair cell has a number of channel proteins in it. And that will become the limiting factor here because channel proteins are needed for active transport. So that's why it's leveling it out here. The, just like in a room, say like in a cinema hall, there are four doors. So at a time, four people can enter. But if there were 10 doors, then 10 people would enter. And time comes if there were 10 doors, 10 do the doors become the limiting factors. If there are 100 people outside, only 10 can come per unit time inside the cinema hall. So understand that is that the channel proteins becomes a limiting factor. I would put an MCQ on this graph, testing this part of the graph. Why has the rate of nitrate absorption leveled out?
Question three, the diagram represents apparatus used to investigate osmosis. Now, if you're investigating osmosis, the first thing you've got to remember, we're going to talk about water molecules. So there's a tube, there's a solution level, there's water, and inside this is a concentrated salt solution. This is what they have told you in the question. And then there is a partially permeable membrane here, which is this part. So it says which molecules will move across the partially permeable membrane and which change will occur in the solution level. Naturally, you've got water outside here. So the water is going to move in. It won't allow the starch to move out. Starch is a very large molecule. So water is going to move in and this level of water is going to rise inside it. So this solution level is going to rise. Whatever the level was, it will rise, it will rise above that. So it will rise and this was the answer that we had for question number three. Then coming on to question number four, starch digestion occurs in the mouth cavity and in the duodenum, but it stops in the stomach. Why is this? All the starch has been digested before it reaches the stomach. No, that's wrong. Cells in the stomach do not produce amylase, but didn't ask that. They said starch digestion occurs in the mouth and in the duodenum, but it stops. Why does it stop in the stomach? Amylase was produced in the mouth. So what has happened to it? Why is it not working in the stomach? From the mouth, the food comes into the stomach. And the fourth wrong answer was the temperature in the stomach is too high for amylase to work. All over the body, the temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. Organs do not vary in temperature. Stomach, intestine, liver, everything has the same temperature, which is the normal body temperature. So the only answer to it was the pH in the stomach alters the shape of the amylase. So this was the correct answer because the stomach is highly acidic because of the HCl produced in the stomach. Then question five, one of the tissues in a leaf was described as consisting of loosely packed cells with a layer of moisture on their surface to dissolve gases so that the gases can diffuse into the cells. To which tissue is this description referring? The fact that it is saying consisting of loosely packed cells, their cells and their large air spaces in between with a layer of moisture. It has a layer of moisture on top of it. This is so that you know when carbon dioxide enters through the stomata here, so the carbon dioxide can easily dissolve and reach the chloroplasts. So naturally the answer was spongy mesophyll. Question six, a growing plant, normally growing plant, is regularly watered with a solution. The concentration of the solution, the composition, sorry, not the concentration, this is how you read wrongly. The composition of the solution is changed, after which the plant leaves become yellow in color. So they become yellow, why? Because now the watering thing is less in magnesium. So adding amino acids in the solution, and that is, of course, required for protein and nitrates. You don't add amino acids. Actually, plants take in nitrates from the soil. Bubbling carbon dioxide through the solution. No bubbling oxygen through the solution. Well, that's not going to help in anything. They've changed the composition of the solution, the watering, the solution, by the solution which was used to water the plant. So please understand that there is a plant growing. And you are watering the plant every day with some sort of a solution. And then with this solution, you change something. The composition of the solution is changed. Maybe it contains nitrates and magnesium and iron and other ions which the plant needs. And now you've changed the solution and you see uh, the plant leaves become yellow in color. So what do you need to do? You need to add magnesium ions to the solution. And that was the answer to this. Now coming to question seven, this is again mentioned in the exam report. It says many candidates suggested that hydrogen carbonate indicator might be involved in this experiment about 
carbon dioxide and photosynthesis. Now that is wrong. You have got to understand hydrogen carbonate indicator is used when we are studying photosynthesis and respiration together. You have a snail and you have a plant in a tube and you have the indicator. So it detects if, you know, if there's only respiration, carbon dioxide is going to increase. If there's photosynthesis, then carbon dioxide is going to be taken up. So it's going to decrease. So it it, it is usually used for sensing the CO2 concentration. So we are studying photosynthesis and respiration. Now, this question was entirely a different question. It says the diagram shows a green shoot photosynthesizing under a glass jar. This was used as a control experiment. Now, we've got to understand what is a control experiment. Control experiment is that which is used for a comparison. That the problem which we are discussing, is it really the main, are we really discussing the correct uh, sequence of events? Like for instance, if I say in a class, the student X is making all the noise in the class. So we will have a class with student X and we'll have a class without student X. So if there's still noise, it means the poor student X was just being uh, blamed for nothing. So now in this, in this experiment, what they've got is they've got a green plant, they've got a filter paper, and they've got water, and they've got a glass jar, and they've got water in the, uh, where the stem is, and there's an airtight bung in it, and we placed it in sunshine. And what are we investigating? We are investigating, it says, which diagram shows the experiment carried out to investigate the need for carbon dioxide in photosynthesis. So we want to say, is really carbon dioxide necessary for photosynthesis or is it just uh, rubbish? Are we just talking uh, wrong? Is it a wrong statement to make? So we will give a plant carbon dioxide and we will not give a plant carbon dioxide. So if I say, if something's making you fat, I say, well, it's the pizza is making you fat. So you uh, take pizzas and one month you don't eat any pizza. So let's see if you put on weight or not. So which diagram shows the experiment carried out to investigate the need for carbon dioxide? Now, the first and the most important thing you've got to understand, a control experiment is an exact replica, but you change just something. Now, in the dark was absolutely wrong. You were not going to do this experiment in the dark because this was being done in sunshine. So then you look at all the three sunshine ones. So this is A, C, and D. Now, A was correct. Why was it correct? Because in this, what you had, you instead of the water, if you look at if you look at this one, it had water here, right? Now here in A, it has sodium hydroxide solution, which is going to absorb the carbon dioxide. Water is not going to absorb the carbon dioxide. So this one, there will be no carbon dioxide, and in this, this there will be carbon dioxide will be present. Now let me discuss the others why they are wrong. This one was of course in the dark, so this was wrong. Now why was C and D wrong? C was wrong because here you had an indicator. Indicator is not, it is to measure the CO2 levels. Is the CO2 levels more or less? But here we were studying photosynthesis. We were not studying photosynthesis and respiration. So hydrogen carbonate indicator is only used when we are studying photosynthesis and respiration. And here, of course, you had nothing here. This, there, was no, there was no beaker here. And as I told you, this has to be an exact copy of whatever that experiment was. So something was missing here. So this was wrong because of that. This was wrong because of the hydrogen carbonate indicator. A large number of students thought that was the correct answer and they wrote C. So that means you're not very clear on this topic if you really thought it was C. Uh, eight, question eight, the diagram shows the elementary canal and some associated organs. Which row shows where amylase is released? Now, of course, we know it's not released in the stomach. So three should not have been correct. So one is where, one is the duodenum, so there where it's released, amylase is released. So one and two and not in three and four. Four was a small intestine and uh, they're not in the ileum. The first part of it is where amylase is released. Release means where, you know, from the pancreas it comes and enters the duodenum. And in the mouth, of course, the salivary glands produce amylase. So where is it released? Of course, where it acts is works in the ileum as well, because it's going to mix with the food and just be carried downwards. Then coming to the next question, nine. The diagram shows a section of the wall of the small intestine in which structure are most lipid components absorbed for transport to the rest of the body. If you're not clear on that, it is these which are the, called the lacteals. And the lacteals then 
from the lymphatics or the lymph vessels and L for lymphatics and L for lipids and L for lacteals so the other of course the D was the capillary network and C was of course just the uh, in between the two villi and then B was the epithelium uh, epithelium lining the villi question 10 which chemical change does not occur in the liver Glucose to glycogen, yes. Glycogen to glucose, yes. Because when your glucose levels are low, you've been fasting. So glycogen will be converted to glucose. If you've had a very highly carbohydrate, more a lot of rice in your food, it's going to be converted to glucose to glycogen. Amino acids to glucose, yes, by deamination. In deamination, the amino part is removed. And the remaining part, and the remaining part is converted into a glucose molecule. So this part is converted into a glucose molecule. Three of these will make a glucose molecule and this amino part will be removed. So amino acids to glucose does happen. Which chemical chain does not occur in the liver? Glucose cannot be converted to amino acid. Why can glucose not be converted to amino acid? Glucose is C6H12O6. But amino acids have a nitrogen part. Where is the nitrogen part going to come? So glucose cannot be converted to amino acid. That's rubbish. Everybody knows that the chemistry of amino acid. This cannot happen. Glucose cannot be converted. Glucose can be, yes, converted to glycogen and glucose can be converted to fats. But glucose cannot be converted to amino acids. And question 11 was a difficult question because you're not very clear on one thing. Is in which direction do water molecules move in the phloem and in the xylem of a plant stem? In the xylem, of course, you've got to realize this is the stem. And this is the roots. And in the xylem, of course, what happens is that water from the soil enters and then will go upwards. But in the phloem, what we've got to understand is phloem is slightly a different story. Why is it a different story? Is because we have a leaf here and there's a leaf here. And in the leaf, glucose is made and then it's converted to sucrose. And the sucrose enters the phloem. And the phloems are going up, but some of the sucrose can go to the roots because the roots do not photosynthesize. And some of this phloem can be going upwards. Why is it going to be going upwards? Because up here, there is a red flower. And the red, red flower cannot photosynthesize. So they can be going in the phloem, they can be going up or down. But in the xylem, it's only going to be up. I'm not saying in the same tube. It will be in different tubes because phloems are made of a bundle of tubes, just like if you have a, a bundle of straws in your hand. The straws with which you drink uh, Pepsi or Coke or something like that. So these different phloem tubes, some will be carrying it up to maybe a red flower up or a white flower up. And some of them might be carrying it down because they're carrying it to the roots where the roots cannot photosynthesize. The roots are the sink. And uh, the leaf is the source. So source to sink. I've talked about this before in my video as well. So it is source to sink. And the source is where it's made, where its photosynthesis takes place. So that is where it's made and use uh, the sink is where it's going to be used, which cannot photosynthesize which maybe does not have the green pigment, like the roots are inside, there are no light, there are no chloroplast in the roots. Question 12. The photomicrograph shows a section through a root. Cell X is the xylem. Cell Y is the phloem. The contents of cell X and the contents of cell Y are each tested with Benedict's and with the iodine solution, which results are expected. Now, cell X exposed Benedict's, there's no sugar in the xylem and there's no starch in the xylem. In cell Y, uh, there's no starch, so it is negative. This is negative, this is negative, this is negative. But there could be some sugars which might have entered into the uh, phloem, and that is why it has been allowed this. I do not agree with this, but still it is given. I think one of the exam reports says that there could be some sugars. 
Now, this again was a challenging question, which is going to check uh, and differentiate between the A's and the B grade students. The photogra photograph shows a cross section of an artery. Which labeled part would be of the same thickness in a vein? Now you see, what they are referring to is C is the inner endothelium or the lining, which I have colored in red here. The thickness of it, how fat is it or how thick is it? Now the same thickness, it's a one cell layer because this is the only thing which is left in a capillary. In a capillary, this is the only thing left. There is no wall, so it's only a one cell thick layer which we find in the capillary. So the three things common in an artery, a vein and a capillary is the inner lining, that is that one cell thick lining, which in technical terms is called the endothelium. But I would only remember, ask you to remember it as the one cell thick layer which lines the arteries, veins. And we're saying the thickness, the thickness is the word which you did not understand. Which label part would be of the same thickness? You see A, B and C, these are the, B is the muscle layer, which is of course non-existent in a vein. And C is the outer layer, which is made up of uh, collagen and elastic tissue. So if you know the structure of an artery and a vein, you have to be very clear on this. Then coming on to question 14. In a muscle, which two substances show net movement from the plasma into the tissue fluid? In a muscle, glucose and oxygen. Net movement from the plasma, so plasma into the tissue fluid. That means this is a capillary. And inside the capillary is the plasma. And outside the capillary is the tissue fluid. Let me just give it another color. So this is the tissue fluid. And this, let me give the muscle. This is in a muscle. So this is a muscle cell. Now it says in a muscle, which two substances show net movement from the plasma into the tissue fluid. Why would they be going into it towards the muscle cell? It would be glucose and oxygen because the muscle cell is respiring and it needs glucose and oxygen for the process of aerobic respiration because muscle cells are, need a high, high energy input. They have a very high energy need. Question 15. The diagram shows an external view of the heart. The left coronary artery is blocked at the point labeled X. How would the blockage first affect the heart? Well, if the blockage is here, this part of the heart is not going to get any. So cells in the wall of the left ventricle die. If it's a partial blockage. If it's a full blockage, then of course it'll die. But if it's a partial blockage, well, they'll get less oxygen and some of it will probably die. So cells in the wall of the left ventricle die. Why? Because there's a blockage here at X. So there's a vessel here and a blockage is here. So these cells which it is supplying will not get the glucose and the oxygen. So these cells will die. Then coming on to question number 16. In a sprint race, athletes may have a sharp muscle pain because the respiring cells produce lactic acid. It lowers the pH and results in muscle cramps. The diagram shows some structures in the respiratory system. What are the label structures? Naturally, one is trachea. Uh, two is the bronchus. Three is the alveolus. And four is the bronchiole. So that was an easy one, wasn't a very difficult one. Question 18. The diagram shows apparatus used to investigate respiration. Thermometer, water, germinating peas, wire mesh, sodium hydroxide to absorb carbon dioxide, colored oil drop. Now immediately when it says respiration, you should write down the equation for respiration. So that is glucose plus oxygen. And this gives you carbon dioxide plus water plus energy release. Now it says which change would be seen and what is the explanation? Why would this oil droplet move towards the left? towards this side. Why? Because these germinating peas are taking up oxygen. 
So the oxygen here is going to be used up by them, but then they are also going to be producing carbon dioxide. Now that carbon dioxide is going to be absorbed. So oil drop moves to the left this way. Why? Because oxygen is used up by the P's and a pressure difference is created. You see, what you've got to understand is that all this place here, which I'm coloring in purple, and all this place here, is contains air. And air has oxygen in it. And when the oxygen is used up, of course, a pressure difference is created. And that is going to make the oil drop move towards the left. Then question number 19. The diagram shows a joint between two bones in the human arm, which correctly describes the joint. Naturally, if everybody is clear about it, this is the U-shaped ulna. And this is the lower part of the humerus. So hinge joint between the humerus and the ulna. It says a human arm, so it has to be either the shoulder joint or the elbow joint. And this is, of course, the elbow joint, so it's between the humerus and this is the U part. And this is the ulna. And this is the humerus. Question 20. Which row shows the parts of the urinary system that carry out different functions? Makes urine, kidney. Carries urine, ureter. Holds urine, bladder. Removes the urine from the body, urethra. So if you know the functions of it, you could have easily done this question. Then coming on question 21. On a hot day, how does the skin react to lower the internal temperature of the body? Arterioles constrict, sweat production decreases, hair stand on end. No, that's wrong. The correct answer was arterioles dilate. Please don't say capillaries dilate. That's the wrong thing. Capillaries cannot dilate. Sweat production increases. It's a hot day. You enter this room, this room is very hot. Hair lies flat against the skin. So set production had to increase on a hot day. So the increase was only here and here. So then you have to read the A, B and D and decide which one was the correct answer. Then question 22, which is of course mentioned in the examiner's report as well. And it says weaker candidates indicated that contraction of the ciliary muscle causes the lens of the eye to become thinner. Now that's of course a misunderstanding of this uh, chapter. So the eyes change focus from looking at a wristwatch near looking at an aeroplane, distant. Now if you remember my mnemonic is DLC, distant less convex, NMC, near more convex. What changes occur inside the eye? So distant, it has to become thinner, less convex. Suspensory ligaments will become taut or tight because the ciliary muscle will relax and it will pull the lens. So you need to revise this if you are not clear on this. You can't be really learning this if it, is, uh, it has to be absolutely clear to be able to do this MCQ. Please go through the video on the I chapter and uh, on my channel and then uh, probably you can get it a bit clearer. That ends this video here and we'll continue the next, uh, the rest of the questions in the second video.